what's going on with Laurie Stewart and Navarro Media. There was a preview clip of a show that went out tonight uh, between Ash Sarkar and Rory Stewart, and it caused quite a hoo-ha. What did he do? He dared to cross the Rubicon. No, he wasn't talking about paedophilia or rape or killing millions of people in a needless war or poverty. He dared to say this about Corbyn. Incidentally, I think it's disgusting he was thrown out of the Labour Party. I mean, it's mad. Jeremy Corbyn, whatever you think of him, is a major figure who represents a very significant part of Labour history and heritage. He was the leader of the party. Now, the interesting thing, of course, about Rory, Rory Stewart is he has got Jewish ancestry himself, and he's also married somebody who's Jewish. So you would think that it would be what you'd call chutzpah to have somebody who is not Jewish basically inferring that what he was done was insensitive to Jews. All the usual suspects piled on and poor Rory he might be strong, he might be hard, he might have been a member of MI5, he might have faced Boris Johnson, but he started to backtrack. But the interesting thing here is the whole process by which this has happened. The fact that nobody now can say anything about Corbyn, unless they are going to include the words anti-Semite, Jew hate, and despicable, that kind of stuff with him. It makes all conversation on what's happening politically in this country absolutely pointless. So what you have here with Rory is very obvious, is what used to be called an old-fashioned sort of Tory, that kind of patrician quality. The kind of politician, really, for those of you who remember it at all, that Ted Heath was. And he also despised, of course, um, Margaret Thatcher. He's a man who loves the Queen, he loves the whole sort of um, a whole establishment of what many think of as traditional uh, English values. And it's obviously partly because he loved his dad. Now, the fact that his dad was in the colonial forces and did some pretty brutal things in Malaysia, I think there's the complication for you there. Because here's this kind of nice guy who his dad wanted to be the Archbishop of Canterbury and he's gone and he's gone to Afghanistan and you know he's been around politics and he's found that the world is a lot nastier than perhaps he'd hoped for but he's still got that Archbishop of Canterbury thing going on and that's why he said of course what he did about Jeremy Corbyn. Now of course uh, this is a much longer interview and I'm just picking out for you some of the things that came up there. But this little excerpt of what he thought about how Jeremy Corbyn operated, particularly in foreign affairs uh, in Parliament, uh, when he was speaking, for example, on Afghanistan, is very interesting. And I think it's something he's very likely to be castigated for yet again. As being about embracing difference and compromise and persuasion and conversations amongst different people. I was proud to be in debates on Afghanistan with Jeremy Corbyn. I listened to him carefully. And you also talk about feeling very marginalised in lots of ways from the party that you were in. And I thought about Jeremy Corbyn. You're both individuals who could be accused of having more to say about Kabul than Carlisle. I mean, do you ever feel that, that there is a kind of similarity or kinship or shared experience? Yes. I mean, I really liked him. I mean, I really liked him. And I found him thoughtful, courteous, and 
he was much closer to being right about Afghanistan and Iraq than most of the Labour or Conservative parties. I think, like all of us, and probably true of me too, sometimes ideology got in and sometimes he simplified things. But broadly speaking, his fundamental insight, which was that these things were a mess, that we entirely lacked, we, the United States and Britain, lacked legitimacy, lacked knowledge, lacked power, and that our presence there was fundamentally unwelcome, and that the idea of putting in 100,000 troops and spending $150 billion a year to try to nation build someone else's country was mad, um, was correct. Now, he seems to think that both Labour and Tories are pretty awful, and I have to agree with that as well. Um, now, I don't want you to think that I'm agreeing with too much of what he says, but when he calls Labour and Tory as both sclerotic parties, I mean, what that means is that they're kind of dead inside, really. Um, I think he's got that totally right. And again, that makes you see much more clearly why he said what he did about Corbyn, because he admires somebody who is principled. Uh the question is, when do you reach a point at which your moral integrity and your view of good and evil makes you break them? And for me, that point came with a hard Brexit and Boris Johnson. That's the point at which I'm like, no, I'm no longer prepared to say I'm part of this tribe. I'm a Tory MP. I'm leaving. I think you reserve that for the moment in which you can see with real moral clarity that this is not it. It's not what you're prepared to do. But on your bigger point, I agree with you on structures. I think we disagree on what the structures are. But fundamentally, this book is about structures. It's about the fact that our first-past-the-post voting system is screwed and needs to be got rid of. That the Labour and Conservative parties are sclerotic, horrible, old-fashioned things. That the institution of the whips is mad. That the culture of the House of Commons is abusive, uh, bullying. That the workplace practices are beyond belief. I mean, I'm describing people who, when I make a speech in the House of Commons that they disagree with, come up from behind the speaker's chair and say they're going to punch me, right? This is not normal. He also talks with some passion, actually, and and, uh, some disgust as well, with the kind of culture that he found when he was working in Parliament. Now, I saw this for myself. I'll never forget when I actually went into Parliament to meet with Jeremy Uh, early on when he was leader and I heard this kerfuffle coming as he came down the corridor and I couldn't think what it was I looked down and uh, uh, when he arrived I said you know what's that about and apparently what it was was Labour MPs calling him a cunt and a fucking bastard now Rory is talking about people meeting him behind the dispatch box and telling him that they're going to punch him. I mean, what are we doing in this country when we have a legislature full of people who will behave like that? So like I said, I've got no doubt that this is going to get him in trouble again. I think if he's got, uh, if he's the person I think he is, he'll probably just extend his Twitter holiday a bit more, which is what he did when this started he went on a Twitter holiday and you know in a way I can understand it because why is it his battle it shouldn't you know it's it in it's our battle it's our struggle on the left to actually get this story across and get more people understanding and again I'm going to say why do I think it's important that that is done well not just for the left although it is important for that There's no way that the left can properly move on until we can come together on this and we can only come together when we actually start speaking to each other. But we have a totally rotten political culture. More surprising, perhaps, is the fact that Ashtakar, Rivka and Aaron Bastani seem to still think it's good enough to be able to interview ex-Tories and, you know, people like that and not actually take any interest in the people that they helped uh, de-platform 
on the left. I'm reaching out to them again. There is still time. There's always time. We need to come to back together on this and you need to do something about this. It shouldn't be left to a Tory to be saying this kind of thing.